Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. I hope your Ramadan is going well. Alhamdulillah, we are coming close to the middle of it. Subhanallah. And I have much to share, but I want to uh, do this talk, inshallah, uh, in my capacity as a epigeneticist or a scientist. And I want to explain to you uh, sort of the biological implications of the cosmological realities of the science of Ihsan or of Dhikr, which I um, talk about a lot, right? So this is going to be a semi-scientific talk. I'm going to try to make everything as simple, as, as um, non-technical as possible. But um, uh, may Allah grant us ease in that. And Tawfiq. Uh, so first we will start off with trying to explain to you what epigenetics is. Some of you might know, but if you take uh, if you take a cell, right, the cell has a nucleus. The nucleus has what we call chromosomes. Now, chromosomes you might be familiar with this X-like shape. This is actually not the typical um, cord formation DNA is in. But never mind that. We'll start with this because you are familiar with it. Now, a chromosome is made up of this tightly, tightly coiled um, uh, single molecule of DNA, right? So if you take, if you if you try to uh, expand that, you take this. This is called a chromatin fiber. It's highly coiled. If you expand that further, you'll see the chromatin fiber is made up of this very beautiful hexagonal arrangement of um, the actual DNA uh, thread, right? So the DNA thread, which is this purple line here, you will see is wound around these proteins called histones, right? So there's a particular way it is wrapped around. And then those threads, subhanAllah, it's very interesting. It's, it's almost like your tasbih. So like these beads on a string. And then these beads tend to wrap around each other. So I always remember Surah Ra'ad. When the thunder starts, Allahu Akbar. So you have this, like this tasbih, yeah? beads on this string. Okay, subhanAllah. Um, now these, these, this, this one bead, oh dear, one mm -hmm. bead and with the DNA wrapped around is called a nucleosome and then there's a particular way they kind of attach to each other and what makes them attach to each other are these particular proteins uh, and different factors, we call these epigenetic factors that have the ability to go and uh, make these beads attach in different ways. So here you actually see your DNA double strand, right? So taking a kind of zooming into that again here, uh, you'll have different, different types of factors. Here's a methyl group, so CH3, acetyl groups, uh, various groups that sit on the tails of the bead itself. And, uh, and they can sit in these very particular uh, different types of arrangements. So subhanAllah, it's, it's highly intricate, highly sophisticated, very much fine-tuned, right? At the same time, they can also sit on the DNA itself. I don't think they've sh shown that here. So if you take this purple strand of DNA, uh, these factors can even go and sit uh, on the DNA itself, uh, usually the methyl groups. Now, depending on how those factors sit and on where, and so what sitting means attaching, uh, chemical bonding. But the DNA, this is the gene. So the gene is basically written in the code of the DNA. It has this particular start site, a stop site. There's a particular way the DNA is read uh, in order for a gene to be active, etc. But depending on how all this machinery is uh, arranged, uh, the gene can be turned on and off. And we are finding that the same genes will have different epigenetic uh, marks depending on where they are. So the gene in the liver cell might be differently epigenetically modified compared to the same gene in a neuron, right, a nerve cell. And subhanAllah, what is, what is really uh, important about this epigenetic control of genes, right? So now remember the DNA, 
uh, is the same. The sequence is the same, but the factors that sit on the DNA, on the histones, on the nucleosome is causing the gene to be uh, active or inactive in a different way. Sometimes the gene can even be fine-tuned, you know, very active, slowly active, a little bit, a burst of energy, shut down for life, hang on, right? So what we are finding is if that, that these... Um, regulations of the genes activity is uh, controlled via epigenetics from various environmental inputs so exercise uh, diet uh, environment huh? subhanallah this is why the quran allah emphasizes looking after the earth we need to make sure the air is clean the earth is clean the trees are happy that we are looking after ecology all of this has a impact on our own health emotional health ones ones um, spiritual religious um, um, uh, what can i say aura <laughs> uh, also stress the opposite of that stress we know for sure impacts the epigenome a lot right so epigenetics is a way for us to biologically explain how the environment impacts our biological functioning by controlling genes. It's, I'm not saying it's the only way, it's the way we have so, so far we are finding out more about it in the past 10, 15, 20 odd years. It's really coming into uh, its own because the, the techniques we need to do epigenomic assays are very, very complicated, very expensive and also you need a high level of training to do this type of work mostly phd level uh, alhamdulillah but it is one way now currently we can understand how the environment is impacting our gene function now in islam i have spoken at length a lot about islam iman and ihsan this tri tripartite the three levels or the three core aspects that the Deenul Islam is based upon. We have your belief, you have your practice, but most importantly, you have Ihsan. Ihsan, and I have said many times, Ihsan is the uh, key aspect of our religion that is most neglected in the way we teach it. This is nobody's fault. It is just a natural uh, outcome of the colonial catastrophe. 300 odd years of Muslim society has been colonized. So when societies are colonized, if you study history, the first thing to go any society, even now, if you take a third world country versus a first world country and a poor country versus a rich country, a poor family versus a rich family, the poorer you get, the more hard your life is. You stick to the basics and you cannot focus on the uh, the extras, right? The same thing at, at social levels, civilizational levels. Uh, when we were colonized, Muslim Oma was colonized, all the finer details of our religion, our practice, the cosmological truths, if you will, the higher order realities were the first things to be lost. Why? Because the people who can get to that level and teach and hold that knowledge, they have to train for many, many years. They have to be in a safe environment. They have to have very few headaches, <laughs> right? If you want to study higher or the Ihsan, you can't be worried so much about making a living all the time or dealing with security issues, war, dealing with also all sorts of headaches you have when you, you, you're, you're financially constrained etc right so in the colonial period two or three hundred years of us being colonized the study of ihsan the books of ihsan the teachers of ihsan the understanding of how various types of islamic practices affect us affect our communities our psychology all that was lost but alhamdulillah the practices mashallah we could hang on to them at least the very basic of them and the belief also, alhamdulillah, that's our foundation. The majority of Muslims retain their iman, subhanallah. So this is the one that goes the last. The practice goes is like the middle. Ihsan is the highest state. Now, subhanallah, we are out of the colonial catastrophe. We have to, and we, are, we have to now build back our foundation of ihsan. That's what we at Irfa are dedicated to do. Now, 
most of, I don't know if you are Muslim or not, but the Muslims will know uh, the practices of Deen and Islam, that is the religion, our way of life, have these five uh, pillars, not, sorry, there are four pillars here, Salat, fasting and Ramadan, Hajj, uh, three pillars here. The other is Zakat and then uh, Kalim, or the Shahada. I have added Quranic recitation also because what I want to show from this slide is that uh, everything really in our deen is a dhikr, a remembrance, right? So our salat is, our, is if you really study it, it is a mind-body meditation. It is not a, a just ritualized worship. Why do I say that? There are particular things you can recite, particular postures you must maintain. The recitations have a certain power and a weight, which the science of Ihsan will explain. For those of you who want to dedicate yourself, to studying this in depth, it will take a lot out of you. Now, the higher the knowledge, the more you have to sacrifice, huh? the more you have to be dedicated. It's not as simple as studying Aqidah or Fiqh. Hmm? Subhanallah. So if you think about Salat, uh, Ramadan is a very high form of dhikr. Uh, Hajj obviously is the the, the most demanding dhikr. But even recitation of the Quran, all of this is what we call dhikr. And dhikr is the foundational principle upon which the science of ihsan is based. Right. So I had to, uh, I'm not sure where I lost you, but I will resume. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in numerous, numerous places, many, many, many places, actually countless places, the idea of dhikr Allah emphasizes and emphasizes over and over again. I said dhikr is the foundation of any study of ihsan, not just study, practice and moving forward in it. So I've just taken two ayat here as examples. Allah says in Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Smeer. My glasses. Fa'idha kudiyat salatu fa'an tashiru fil addi wa bata'u min fadlillahi wa dhkuru laha kathiran la'allakum tuflihun. Al-Nadaya, ya ayuhal ladhina amanu dhkuru laha dhikran kathira. Well, the first one, Allah says, so when you finish your prayer, so even after your salat, huh? disperse through the land, uh, so go about in your normal business through the land, seeking Allah's fadl. So what is this usually going to for uh, work, going with our family life, all the usual things we do, seeking Allah's bounty, his blessing. But Allah says, even then, kathiran. remember Allah, kathiran. A lot abundantly. So that you will have falah, success, not just success, well being. You'll be in a good state, you will be sound, secure. So Allah says this not just salat, salat is not your, and not just sitting after salat for 10 minutes with your, you know, the, the basic adhkar we do. Allah says, no, no. When you are engaged in seeking the father of Allah, traveling, that means basically out of the prayer, out of the masjid, whatever else you do, remember Allah kathir and abundantly. This will bring you falah. What is falah? Well-being. So now we are moving into understanding these ayat from the perspective of the science of Ihsan. And today, inshallah, I will take, t tell you a little bit about what we are now discovering about how it impacts biology. And then Allah says in another ayah, Ya yuhaladzina amanu adkurullah dhikran kathira wo you who have faith. Remember Allah with an abundant remembrance. So whenever dhikr comes in the Quran, Allah, no limits, abundantly, excessively. As much as you can. It is only one of two things in the Quran. If you study the Quran, Allah says, do without limit. Everything else, we are moderate. We are umatul wasata, we are moderate, except these two. Seeking knowledge, remembering all. Dhikr, dhikr, dhikr. Always. This is your constant state. Huh? Our Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had trained himself so much that even when he's asleep, his heart goes, Allah, Allah, Allah. 
So this is be, this will become your state when you practice more and more. Dhikr. Certainly, this was the state of the Sahaba, Radhiallahu Taala Anhu, and the Salihun. Mm. Okay. So much was the understanding, the cosmological understanding, the philosophical understanding, the biological understanding of the old Muslims, of the importance of this Quranic ayah where Allah is instructing, commanding that we are in dhikr all the time. That prior to this colonial catastrophe and the Mongol invasion, the two big catastrophes we went through as a civilization, zikr was the default state for every aspect of a Muslim lifestyle, right? Why? Because that is the only way you can achieve the state of ihsan, this, this third essential uh, component of living the life of a Muslim being a true follower, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, what is ihsan? Uh, Allah, sorry, Rasul alaihi wasallam. He defined it. I use that definition rather than all the translations. In the Hadith Jibril, which I've spoken about many times, Rasulullah alaihi wasallam said, "To ihsan is to be mindful of Allah." As if you see Allah. And if you cannot see Allah, know that Allah sees you. So you are constantly in a state of awareness of the divine gaze upon you. Meaning you are constantly in a state of awareness of divinity, of tawheed, of la ilaha illallah, in everything, right? Some people reach the level of. Uh, so much taqwa, it is as if they are seeing Allah. So we won't go into that. That is very high order. Obviously, our Prophet ﷺ achieved these states. So he wouldn't talk about them in this way. Subhanallah. <laughs> Certainly in the Mi'raj. Uh, um, so basically, Ihsan is a state of being that is to be a muttaqi of Someone who has taqwa of Allah in all things at all times. So we come into harmony with the cosmological basis of wahdaniya. La ilaha illa. Now that, what does that mean? We can write a books on that sentence. So we won't leave it for now. But this is how our Prophet defined it. So Muslims, the Sahaba, anhu, and the early generations after him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, took this to heart and as the civilization expanded and we built and became very wealthy and powerful uh, mashallah they have hung on to that before the catastrophes i mentioned before so dhikr became the default state of everything in the muslim civilization's lifestyle not just the actual praying and making dua and dhikr and salawat but dhikr in our art, huh? if you take classical Islamic art, it is extremely repetitive. Dhikr is repetition. We remember, 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 remember. Mm -hmm. This is how you make your memory sharp, by repetition. There is no other way. Any, any student who is watching this will know. I know. We are all students till we die. So even our art has these repetitive patterns, which are a dhikr, a visual dhikr. Um, music in the old Muslim world was to sing salawat ala nabi or to sing long poems uh, praising Allah, uh, extolling the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So basically there is no other pop music, right? No other going to concerts. If you go to a concert, it is dhikr. Uh, or in Egypt, very famously, the Quran recitation, uh, the Qur'a, the people who are adept in Quran recitation, the music concert would be that people would gather and someone would be reciting Quran from, from Isha until Fajr and they will stay the whole night listening to such beauty in the way the recitation. Right? Uh, Subhanallah, this is, I, some, some may not like it, it might be controversial, but even uh, our entertainment in terms of movement, there were some forms of dhikr practiced by some people that require bodily movement within their dhikr as well. And this is also in a hadith, Sayyidi Abu Bakr, 
is known to one day he was in such a state of dhikr he started subhanallah he started turning sometimes that happens when your heart becomes so attuned with allah your body starts moving in ways you can't ex explain i mean at the lowest level we have the tawaf right you see it has something happens to you when you move in this way now when you give yourself up completely to that uh, you will find things happening to you that you you have to experience to explain that's why you should never judge until you have experienced yourself right so everything in the old muslim world uh, was focused on dhikr so whether you were making pots for a living whether you were a tile maker whether you were weaving carpets uh, whether you were a trader everybody had their dhikr jama'a with a leader someone who has authority with a chain going up to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam usually either through sayyidi abu bakr or sayyidi uh, ali karamallahu wajha that will give you authority authorization in how to uh, be in this constant state of dhikr all the time right so in everything we had it was always dhikr so this is how that society has reached the level of ihsan that our muslim societies are still struggling to do still struggling our muslim world if you see mostly corruption uh hoarding of wealth huh? Uh, inequality between the sexes, um, great poverty, usually due to great corruption. We can't say Muslim countries are poor. We can say they are corrupt. <laughs> uh, lack of uprightness, lack of honesty, lack of punctuality, lack of respect uh, for Allah's creation. We destroy the environment. Subhanallah. Wars, Muslims fighting Muslims. Subhanallah. So all these problems. So we cannot really say we have reached that level of ihsan as an ummah of the nation of Muhammad. Now we are very, very far from it. Generally, we are just struggling to hold down to Iman and Islam even. Sometimes there's no even Islam. There's just struggling to hold down to Iman. Many minority communities know this very well. SubhanAllah. So may Allah be merciful with us and gentle with us. But you can imagine, before the colonial catastrophe, the Mongol invasion, the Muslim Ummah reached its pinnacle. Its pinnacle was in the time of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa pinnacle of Ihsan. But even before these catastrophes, there was some level of Ihsan in those societies. And people, generally Muslims, had a great level of taqwa of Allah, much more than we have today. Because... They implemented this science, the science of Ihsan. They knew it, they were taught it, they were trained in it, they trained themselves in it. So every year, every day, every week, you do your dhikr, you attend your um, majalis of dhikr, you keep purifying, purifying, purifying your heart. Now, this is not just there is a biological basis because we have we are people of la ilaha illallah nothing ever happens separate to allah right so our biology is not separate to our dhikr right because everything infects everything else this is the meaning of tawheed so now we are understanding how these spiritual practices of our predecessors really impacted our biology our well-being our health and we see this a lot now. Muslim societies, we have lost our deep devotion to dhikr all the time. We see more and more illnesses and difficulties coming into our societies. Though we practice Islam, why, why, why are all these illnesses coming? Because we don't practice ihsan. We don't practice ihsan. I don't mean just being in excellent manners. <laughs> ihsan is also the science of manners. Ihsan is the science of learning how to train and be in a state of always being aware of Allah's Qudra, Allah's presence and understanding the signs of Allah in everything. So there is nothing that happens in your life that is by accident, right? Everything is by the design and plan of your Lord. Bismillah. Okay. Now, uh, the next two slides are for, for, a, for a lecture I will do for a class on Ihsan, so I, but I kept this here it's from, a, from a paper, Alhamdulillah, just published. 
the epigenomic impact. So, Ihsan, obviously, you can't read any of this, but it catalogs about 15 odd studies, publications in English, scientific publications in the English language from uh, various studies, various parts of the Muslim world, one in California, actually, in Berkeley, actually, uh, also, talking about how dhikr, different types of dhikr, Quranic recitation, salat, uh, pure dhikr, yani just regimens of al -Khar, how they have impacted various health benefits, right? Now, I don't want, I can't go into all of that, but just here, but one in Berkeley, uh, Malaysia, India, uh, Indonesia, etc. Uh, this is the rest of that table, Iran, Tunisia, uh, Quranic recitation for anxiety, for, for athletes, <laughs> for patients of different types of adkar, the asmaul husna, all of these studies showing that they have certain health impacts. But they just show the health impact. We don't know how it is impacting. What I want to talk to you about today is how we are understanding more and more how the, the how these adhkar are probably impacting our biology. So then we come to this question, but does dhikr actually change the epigenome? Does it change your genes? Does it change your genes? Why is that such a critical question? I will come to that, inshallah, at the end. Subhanallah, in the past five odd years, they have been the first serious, hardcore, high resolution, what some people call cutting edge scientific studies on looking at the epigenome and how it can change according to a dhikr practice. Now, I say dhikr practice, but we haven't done it for dhikr yet. Uh, mashallah, the first study is on mindfulness-based meditation, mm -hmm. meditation studies. So, uh, but if you think of meditation, really, a lot of the aspects of mindfulness-based meditation, I just refer the paper here, are found in serious disciplines of dhikr. I don't mean... Uh, what most normal Muslims do, mashallah, may Allah reward them, but I mean people who have higher order level of ihsan, they have certain ways they do their adhkar. Hmm? Uh, you will find that, that the process of training is very much akin to what you have in these studies where they used mindfulness-based meditation and showed epigenetic uh, impacts. Right, so um, this is another table from that same paper, and this one shows studies in meditations done by non-Muslim disciplines. So two other Eastern disciplines, the Vedic Hindu Buddhist axis and the Taoist uh, tra traditional Chinese medicine axis. Mashallah, they are way ahead of us in understanding these things now, though we used to have a lot more knowledge before we have lost all that. Fortunately, we are too busy fighting over ourselves and wasting our time with frivolous pursuits, unnecessary things. In this month of Ramadan, reduce your food, reduce the time you spend on food, uh, increase the time you spend on thinking of Allah, understanding the Quran, learning about creation, learning about cosmology, so that your physical lack of interest in food will help you move your this is i shouldn't get into some science here but um what i want to say is now other other faith communities are going way ahead and we have to catch up because this is our lost wealth our lost wealth so in this table from that same paper these are focused scientific epigenetic studies showing how for example in this Example, uh, mindfulness-based meditation is actually changing the epigenome, changing how the gene is controlled. So here, this is from one paper. These are basically the green refers to that the gene is turned on, for example. The red would be the gene is turned off. This is before and after eight hours of meditation, right? 
And the scientists compared that to a control group, another group, they said, okay, you, you watch a movie or go for a walk for eight hours, do some leisure activity, something to relax you for eight hours. But those leisure activity people did not have this change. It was only in the mindfulness-based meditation that they showed this change. I am, I am giving this to you at a very, very simple, basic level. So if any of you are scientists, don't come after me, go and read the paper, you will have all the details there, right? So this was shown, this type of signal was found in many epigenetic studies from SubhanAllah Australia, for yoga they did, for Tai Chi they did, uh, residential vipassana based meditation, I think in California they did, uh, meditation retreats, one month retreats also I believe in California, uh, MBSR interventions for veterans, war veterans with PTSD. So now they are really doing the epigenetic studies, right? The Muslim studies, we are, we are still a bit behind. Yeah, so, <laughs> but what's interesting, all these Eastern meditative practice axes, I have defined them as the Islamic Sufi Yunani Tib. Yunani Tib is the traditional medicine in the Muslim world, which has a lot of uh, cross-currents with the what the science of Ihsan, wrongly I would say term Sufi, but Sufi is a term many people are familiar with. The Vedic Hindu Buddhist Ayurveda axis, SubhanAllah, Allah has sent the rain. It's very hot and we are grateful to our Lord. And the Taoist traditional Chinese medicine, right? Now, in this sort of figure, what we've done is we've put all these different meditative practices, uh, depending on whether they use sound or not, whether they have movement or not, whether they have posture dependency or not. So that's a science. I told you about the science of medicine. Eh. And what's interesting is the, the Vedic and the Taoist uh, origin, meditative axes, their practices are based on what is usually considered mindfulness. The Islamic is based on what we call heartfulness. We focus on the heart as the main vehicle, the main vehicle, the main organ for spiritual transformation, whereas others would focus on the mind. So that is something unique we have to bring and we have to develop that. Or we have to bring it into modern terms. All this knowledge is there. Allah has preserved it. But he has kept it secret until the people who deserve to know it and who will honor it and cherish it, dedicate their sins, themselves to it, come to bring it out. May Allah grant us many of those people. Amen, Allah. And also something we understand when we study them on a cursory level is that dhikr really, so lots of dhikr in different parts of this 3D graph. It's the easiest. It has most diverse meaning. It has the most different forms, right? Has the least amount of training required. And in my experience, also the most powerful. So, um, right. Now, let's tie all of this into pathophysiology. This is really a more scientist's diagram. Maybe some of you who are doctors and so what will understand. But basically what it's showing here is these three axes, meditative axes, they are so far the studies show their impacts on all these diseases and states. And when you think about it from the, or you look at it, the data from the biological pathophysiological aspect, we are understanding how they uh, affect certain uh, genes that encode usually uh, inflammatory marks, uh, transcription factors that work in inflammation, and inflammation is, is often um, associated with stress and causes many different types of diseases, right? And then we have this uh, particular gene, the PONC gene, in the, which is exquisitely epigenetically controlled. It has this is too technical, but I hope maybe there's a scientist out there, but it has huge introns with many uh, CPG islands and areas that are primed for epigenetic regulation, very few exomes. Okay, so all this worked together. And the one study I found in Malaysia that actually did some biological testing found a reduction in uh, 
factors, endorphins, beta endorphins, um, sorry, an increase in endorphins due to the liquor. And that ties very nicely into pathophysiological framework. Mashallah, these, these are old, old Sufi centers that work in de-addiction. They use liquor to cure people of alcohol and opium addiction. Opioid addiction, you may not like to hear it, but addiction to opium or opioids was a big problem in the Muslim world for centuries. And the Muslim Hakims, which is the medical practitioners of Nunani Tib, and the Murads, that is the spiritual masters of the science of Ihsan, would use dhikr as a form of therapy to treat them. So that is still being done, mashallah, in some traditional Muslim worlds, right? So basically, all these meditative practices connect to each other. Right, now, um, Now I mentioned the Hakims and I mentioned the Murads. What are these? I hope most of you are familiar. Maybe you may not be. But basically, some of the Hakims well known in Yunani Tib, uh, for example, Al Razi understood that there's a, he defined something called a Tibba Ruhani and a spiritual medicine, right? Uh, Ibn Sina talked about the physiological basis of psychology. Uh, al balqi talked about psychosomatic medicine, cognitive therapy, so understanding how one's mood, one's thoughts, one's psyche affect one's body. One, and we know a lot of diseases, not modern diseases or autoimmune diseases caused by either psychological stress or stresses in our environment because we don't live in a pure environment anymore. Tabari talked about Sickness that can be tied to imagination. So these are all, subhanAllah, over a thousand years ago. We are yet to see Muslim names in the past 500 odd years that have made such major contributions. As I said, we have been going through colonial catastrophes ever since the time of Imam Ghazali. First the Mongols, then the colonial invasions. State of the heart tied to human disease. Imam Ghazali talks about that a lot. Music therapy of Al-Kindi, understanding the impact of sound on one's health and psyche. So this is why we do so much salawat and so much dhikr that is sung. Huh? You should not say no until you know why you are saying no. So don't just get angry at everything traditional Muslims do. They may not know why they do it. Because their teachers and the theory books are been burnt, teachers have been killed. But there is a reason they've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, if you take the spiritual master of Ihsan, the teacher of Ihsan, they would talk about doing daily regimens of dhikr as preventative. They might use specialized dhikr formula as treatments or rukya. Uh, they would understand spiritual ailments or so possession by the jinn. They believe in the jinn, right? How that works with one's psychology, which is very difficult, how black magic works. Purely spiritually diseases, for example, if you are suffering from excessive jealousy, excessive anger, uh, how that works, and so forth. And there's a lot of interconnection between these two very often murads are also hakims, uh, some hakims are also murads. If you have been trained in both, you will use both to treat. And in the Islamic medicine, we don't treat a disease, we treat a person. So it usually varies from person to person. Hence also very difficult to write textbooks and record that knowledge. Unfortunately, that means if the country or that community or that kingdom is under attack, if that person dies or is killed, the knowledge goes. It's very hard to record it. So here I've given some names, Said Arabia, Abu Talib al-Makki, Junaid, Ibn Mashish, Sayyidi Jilani, Rumi, obviously, who are masters of the science of Ihsan. As much as you have Imams of Fiqh, you have Imams of Iman, and you have Imams of the science of Ihsan. So you should know these names and get to know these people and learn what they taught. Right. Now I want to end. Uh, this is the slide before the last, I believe. With this very, uh, I would say maybe, perhaps it's controversial, perhaps con contentious, but I think it's correct from my own experience and understandings and readings and studies and travelings, subhanAllah, in the past 
decade or so, and from before that. The idea of how we evolve as a species. Now, many of you are familiar with Darwinian evolution, right? This is the idea of survival of the fittest. So here, if you have a bunch of giraffes, some have long necks, some have short necks. What Darwin proposed is a theory that uh, because the long neck giraffes have an advantage to eat the leaves, the short ones would die out. The long ones would then breed amongst themselves and that is how the giraffes became long-necked over generations. Now, at the same time Darwin proposed his theories, a scientist called Lamarck, he proposed something radically different. He said giraffes originally started out short, but they kept reaching and reaching and reaching. They ate all the lower leaves and they wanted to reach the higher leaves, so they kept reaching and reaching. So over generations, their necks got longer and longer. Now, Lamarck at that time, he was really mocked and scoffed and his ideas were basically thrown in the garbage uh, and Darwin's ideas were popularized. If you're a scientist and this has happened to you, you know how painful it is, but you have to hang on to your convictions and believe in your truth. Allah will always take your side if you are on the side of truth. So you now we know from epigenetics that Lamarck was right in a sense, right? He was right because we know that, for example, if this lady, uh, she smokes, that will not only impact her baby, it will impact the eggs in, if the child, if the child is female, it will impact the epigenetic signature of the eggs in her child. So not only will her offspring, to use a genetic verb, her children be impacted, but her children's children. So you have three genes. When I teach this to my science students, I often say, if you are in a good state of health, go and hug your grandmother. <laughs> Thank her that she had a good lifestyle and was very healthy in her habits. So that is impacting you. And if you are not, beware, you are impacting not just yourself, your kids, and generations to come. So at a very surface level, we are beginning to understand how our Spiritual practices, how Allah's command in the Quran, be in zikr all the time for your own falah, is impacting our biology. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask the question now. I think, subhanAllah, if you were born Muslim, I would say maybe your grand, great grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents, you would, if you look at, if you had the baraka to understand the way they lived, you will see how much zikr was their life. Now you think of us, we have TV, we have, we have every entertainment is not based on zikr. So in the Islamic traditional world, entertainment is an essential thing. All human beings need it. You can't be serious all the time. But that should be based upon our zikr because nothing goes out of the cosmos of la ilaha illa. Our play is not dhikr, our music is not dhikr, our dancing is not dhikr, our fun is not dhikr, right? And that's what we spend most of our time on. Our work is not dhikr, or we spend a lot of time on work. The way we bring up our children is not based on dhikr. So you can imagine then that we are, in my opinion, we are de-evolving as a species. Because the more you move away from this training, the less your biology is able to support spiritual realities that Allah is waiting to teach you. You can't hold it, right? You get impatient, you get tired, you get, you can't hold your concentration. How many of you know this, especially students of memorizing the Quran know this very well. If they lose their uh, daily training and Memorizing, it is gone, right? If they watch a movie that has some badness in it, they will find their memory is going. A certain ayah will go from their head, right? So it has an impact. So the what we can hold now is because of what our ancestors did. And if we continue in this way, subhanAllah, yani TV came on in the past few decades, our modern lifestyle, post-World War II, things changed a lot after the Industrial Revolution, our food became difficult, uh, air is now polluted, uh, water, <laughs> so many things. We wonder what is going to happen in the future. So these are very serious things we have to be aware of and learn about. So may Allah increase us in knowledge and 
the ability to live according to that knowledge. This is Ramadan. All the shayateen are chained up. Make your resolutions and start training in them. So I'll end with this another figure from a paper which is, inshallah, being considered to be published in a book called Heartfulness. May, may Allah reward the people involved in bringing that out from the Al-Qaram Institute. Basically, explaining how the ruh, qalb, aql, jism, how this quartet works in the human being. We teach this in the science of Ihsan. What is the function of the ruh, function of the aql, the function of the qalb, the function of the jism. You should know this. You should know this. And trust me, all this Rasul Alaihissalam taught. He may not have taught it in these simplified ways, but he would have certainly taught it just by sitting there and doing what he was doing. It is the same, and he never wrote the Quran. Sayyidina Osman compiled it, so people wrote it in pieces and people in pieces. So there's nothing wrong with that. We are simplifying things, making it accessible because we do not have the physical presence of Muhammad Salawat. So if he was here, we wouldn't need any of this. We could just sit with him. Um, briefly, the jism is your seed, the body, right? That holds everything about your life here on earth. So we'll have another jism and leave your dunya life. You should know about that. Your akal is, is the seat of the akal, I say, is the brain. The akal is not... Entirely the brain, but the seat of the akal is the brain. It is the organ created for you to handle the mulk, the known universe, right? It's based on the five extant senses. The qalb, the spiritual heart, the seat of the qalb is your physical heart. It is the organ created for you to tra transcend the mulk and enter the malak. The heart can do that. The akal cannot. Hmm? Even you develop the heart. The ruh is from the Amr of Allah. It is the faculty that makes a human being what is what the angels were commanded to bow to and the jinn. And it is uh, able to transcend all the seven dimensions. The Mulk, Malakut, Aiza, Jabarut, Kursiya, Arshiya, up to the Dal. As and how Allah chooses, the ruh does not age. We should stop there. <laughs> this is too much for this medium. So may Allah reward uh, you all. May Allah forgive all of us, uh, myself especially. May Allah continue to shower his barakah upon us, his uh, fadl, his rahmah, his mawadda, his ma'afira, who take us to where we are meant to go in our dunya life, fulfill our destiny for us, and write for us a beautiful beautiful, majestic destiny that is pleasing to our Lord, well-pleasing to our Lord, well-pleasing to ourselves, that we are also very happy. May Allah continue to bless you the rest of your life. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.